Great. Our next speaker is David Rosenman. David is a hospital-based general internal medicine physician at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. He is also an assistant prof professor of medicine in its College of Medicine and leads the six-week preclinical block in its medical school there. David is going to speak about some new ideas uh, in training physicians. Let me, let me start by saying if, if you have a personalized urology need to address now, <laughs> I've included some fairly bland historical slides at the beginning to allow for you to come back and really not miss anything that you can't look up. <clears throat> I, uh, I would like to start by thanking Larry and um, to say that it is such an honor to be with all of you here and, um, and also to pause just for a moment to appreciate w what Larry and his team have put together, which is an extraordinary dialogue that includes lots of conversations. So in a day and a half, um, under the umbrella of personalized medicine, We've heard uh, about policy and economics and about uh, genomics, molecular biology, ethics, professionalism, frustration, passion, love. Um, and it really isn't one discussion. It's lots of them. Uh, and it's only in a place like this where, where those sorts of exciting interactions can happen. Everything in life that's exciting happens at the boundaries. Isn't that true? Um, at the riverbank in biology, in, at the semi-permeable lipid bilayer in a cell, in statistics at the um, standard deviation, uh, I suppose f at a toy store where the nose presses up against the glass. Just touching. I mean. <laughs> Does anybody know who this is? besides one of the many old white men who characterized the history of power in the United States, unfortunately. Um, I can tell you what he was doing with, with almost certainty. 100 years ago right now in Kentucky. Does that help anyone? Um, I, I, so he, he, this is Abraham Flexner. Someone knew that. And um, Abraham... Abraham Flexner um, was commissioned by the Carnegie Foundation um, to do an 18-month review of all the medical schools in the United States, starting in January 1909 and finishing 100 years ago this past month. And, um, ooh, lemon. And 100 years ago next month, he published, he finished writing after working day and night, which is how I know 100 years ago he was working on it, because he worked feverishly this month 100 years ago. He published what came to be called the Flexner Report. And the Flexner Report came to be the most cited um, document in the history of medical education. What he found in a nutshell after going to all the medical schools in the United States and in Canada was that there were thousands of them, right? So they're like 149 right now. But at the time, there were thousands. And then those thousands of schools kind of spanned the spectrum from being um, academic medical centers that produced really uh, thoughtful and smart clinicians to for-profit garages run by a couple of guys and their buddies for, for the opportunity to make money by giving diplomas to people who listened to some lectures and played with some beakers and then said they were doctors. And Flexner said, this is outrageous. We can't be doing this. And there was already a movement underway to change and standardize medical education in the United States. But Flexner was this charismatic person who put his heart and soul, his heart and his soul, into, into changing things. And so um, what he did afterward was after he wrote the report, then he went around and he got a lot of money and he got philanthropists to put money into making medical schools that, sh that, that were the way he thought they should be. And then the New York Times in 1959 uh, in his obituary on the front page, said no other American of his time contributed more to the welfare of his country and of humanity in general. Um, here, are the, here are the bland historical slides for your edification. A couple of years after the report, um, a physiologist, by I believe the name of Lawrence, said, <clears throat> for the first time in human history, a random patient with a random disease, consulting a doctor chosen at random, stands a better chance uh, than 50-50 of benefiting from the encounter. Now, 
I, I want to clarify that because I think that 2,000 years ago in China, there were a lot of people who benefited from medicine, who benefited from interaction. I think the subtlety here is that this was all random, right? Any person, any physician, because there was some sort of standardized knowledge that was beginning to be held by clinicians. And so the authors of this article, which came out in 2010, said the education of doctors mattered because for the first time in history, medicine actually mattered. And so each of these little examples that I give you today um, illustrate points which I think can be brought forward um, uh, to understand new things at boundaries. So in the last hundred years, here are a few of the things that happened kind of in rapid fire. There are lots of regulatory agencies, um, not the least of which are the National Board of Medical Examiners, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, the uh, Association of American Medical Colleges, uh, and lots of others, and private insurance companies, and um, the legal world, and the federal government, and uh, so forth, and individual programs. And together, those regulatory, re regulatory forces are very, very strong. And I'll share with you what I, what I think that means, both for someone who wants to practice medicine, but in a, in a translatable way for a person who is cared for in the healthcare setting. Since 1910, required knowledge base has increased dramatically. Delivery of care has, been, has become vastly more complicated. And I put an asterisk there because Flexner didn't say one word about delivery 100 years ago. That was the word did not appear. There's no discussion of healthcare delivery. Expectations of the public today are higher. Trainees spend more time in graduate medical education than they do in medical school. That's an important point because some have argued that if Flexner were alive today, and there's some people who pray every night that he were, um, he probably wouldn't be writing a report about medical school. He would probably be writing it about the, the stage in medical education that trains people to go to care for others, which is now residency and fellowship. But at the time, people would finish medical school and go take care of people. So um, uh, the, the last stage in training is no longer medical school. Expectations of the public are higher. Trainees spend more time in residency and fellowship, and more uh, disease is chronic. There's a strain between teaching and research, which I'd be happy to chat with you about if you have questions. We have computers. We have the internet. There's a cultural change that promotes shorter work hours and less independence. Do you understand how that works, those two? If, if as a system, we expect you to work 40 hours in a row, and you get a day or two off here and there, and now as a system, we say, well, that's not fair. You should only work 36 up to 40, but, but maybe 24 or 36 hours in a row. Then one way or another, you have to work more days, and it makes your life um, a little bit more complicated. And so just by way of, um, oh, and, and none of this, by the way, that I just mentioned is really covered much in medical school. Um, compartmentalization of medical education into discrete stages with abrupt often difficult transitions has led to inefficiencies in training. One of those transitions is in the middle of medical school between the, the, the second year and the third year, and um, usually that's just like a, a wink. In other words, first you, you're trained like a Pavlovian dog to find the right answers on tests and to fill on scan, Scantron sheets with a number two pencil in the 20th century, and now you do it on, online. Um, and, and then all of a sudden one day you show up in the hospital and there are people who have needs and complaints and emotions and frustrations and people are working together and you haven't been prepared for this at all. Um, and that's just a reflection of what Flexner proposed, which is you study in the classroom and then you go into the hospital and you work as an apprentice and that should be good enough. And it's not anymore, I don't think. Um, I just threw this in with partial relevance, but um, in the men's room I ran into one of my trainee colleagues from the clinic. And, I said, hey, how are you? I, I, and he asked me where I was going, and I said, where are you going? And he said to Nigeria to see his wife. And I said, how long are you going to be gone? He said, two days. And that's because that's the window of time that he has. He loves his wife, and I know she loves him. <laughs> <clears throat> OK, so that's the historical stuff. I hope that all the, um, that the uh, environmentally conscious toilets and urinals um, are no longer flushing, and here we'll get into the fun stuff. So parts. So we've been talking a lot about parts. So there are um, microbiological parts and macrobiological parts and parts to the hospital and parts, parts, parts. And that's kind of what medical school has been all about. So let, let's apply this. I love metaphors. I can think concretely, I promise, but I love metaphors. So, so let's start with a car. Because a car is something that you need to learn how to use in order to get through life somehow, right? Um, and so, so here's a car. Um, and the car has parts. So it's got the, 
the, uh, the headlights and the wheel. That's a bumper. I think I first, I second era. It's funny. Uh, and and tail lights and and you know the tires. And let's let's look inside the car. So there's the dashboard, and uh, of course it has um, um, uh, the speedometer and uh, the oil thing and the the steering wheel and you know the, the emergency button for the blinkers and the GPS and so forth, and all these parts. So you memorize the parts, and then, of course, there's the back seat. Um, and so in the back seat of that car, you have the, the reading lights <laughs> and the, um, you know, the, the, the privacy curtains and the thing for your foot, um, or, and, and the armrest that doubles as a Veuve Clicquot bottle holder, and, you know, just sort of the usual parts. And don't forget there's the there's the motor, so you've got to memorize those parts. And so the question is, if you know all of those, then can you just like plow through? And the answer is you kind of can't, because it's just not enough. It's not enough if you want to navigate the roads and deal with the complication of all of those roads and occasionally to get you know, <laughs> a lot of different signals and you don't really know what to do with them. And occasionally there's stuff you don't expect at all. And, and what do you do with that? So it's, a, it's, it's, it's metaphor, thank you. It's, it's, so it's, it's, it's a metaphor, but it really it reflects that energy that you put into laughing reflects what people experience when they just memorize parts and then they have to deal with complication and complexity. So a moment here about complicated science and complex reality. So baking a cake is simple. It's a simple system. Um, if, you, if you follow the directions, then you make a cake. And the cake turns out to be more or less like the cake that someone else who follows the same recipe uh, would, would, would come up with. And then if you design a spacecraft um, that can go out into space, aim a really high resolution camera at the sun, take a movie of it, and then email it back to the, to the, to the Earth, and then post it on National Geographic's website so that I can look at it and then tweet how cool I think it is, that's not simple, that's complicated. And, um, and, and so, uh, and, and that's a snapshot from the video, which I encourage you to watch because it's extraordinary. Um, but but it's, an, it's an example of a complicated system, and I'm really not being uh, sarcastic here. It, it's, it, it requires math, it requires lots of really hard math. And that's, that's the fundamental difference between that and baking a cake. If, if it's complicated, it's still reproducible. Other people can do it. That's how, what biomedical research is all about. It's about re reproducing findings, right? So theoretically, we could have a, 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 the sequel, right? To Sun, which could be another part of the Sun, um, because we know how to do the math. Now, this is Sam. Sam just turned seven, and I love him. But, uh, but nothing, but nothing. And, <laughs> and so, and so Sam, Sam is, Sam is my child, and what I do for Sam doesn't necessarily work for what I do for Stella, who's now three. And um, pause for appreciation of their beauty. <laughs> and so, so that's a complex system. It doesn't matter how good I think I am at it. It doesn't matter whether I read all of Dr. T. Barry Brazelton's books or Dr. Spock's books or if I listen to my wife who's a pediatrician, or if I watch videos about how to be a dad, or if I just wing it um, when my wife goes out of town. <laughs> no, no, no matter what happens, I can't get reproducible results. So I, 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 I take in, in, my, in my soul the understanding that this is complex, and that I deal with complexity, and I welcome uncertainty, and I become a master of uncertainty. You all who are parents have stories of the funny stuff that happens in uncertainty. Okay, with kids. And, and kids um, are, are kind of skipped over in the healthcare discussion in the United States. And this has come up a few times in our dialogue today. There are so many reasons, um, both metaphorical and concrete, why we shouldn't skip over kids. Um, I believe, if, as someone who studies innovation as a discipline, that childhood instinct is the, the perfection that precedes lifelong improvement. <laughs> and I think that that's true at the um, medical level, at the biological level, um, and at the cognitive level, at the political level. I think so many things about children um, are, are valuable and overlooked. Um, 
we know that from evolutionary biology that um, we, we tend to follow these patterns by skipping over childhood, and then we have a problem. And so how do we take care of the person who, who's, who's here? Well, we, we react. That's how we do it. We, we, we still love and care for this person the same way that we did when that person was a child, except somehow that person got to that stage. And so healthcare looks like this right now in the United States, and I must give credit to my colleagues in palliative medicine who frame healthcare like this. You work really hard with active, aggressive intent to try to cure and solve everything early in life, and then you throw in the towel and you, you, you focus on palliative intent, which means just having people be comfortable and you don't try to cure anything, you control pain. It's a, it, it is the human side of medicine, which unfortunately, in this day and age in the United States, we reserve for the time when there's nothing else to do. And so palliative care doctors propose that the graph over life look more like this. Um, as the former governor said, that early in life, we give people every benefit that we have in terms of diagnostics and therapeutics, and we come to an understanding that when a person gets to be a certain age, and some people argue with the, with the notion of rationing based on age, and I don't know that that is exclusive of, from this diagram. This is more philosophical, which is that rather than waiting until you have to have the big family discussion in an ICU at three in the morning in a state you've never been in with people you've never met about whether or not grandpa would want to be on a breathing machine or not, philosophically it makes a whole lot more sense to stay close as a big extended family and to have these discussions, maybe not even necessarily explicitly because you don't have to, because there's a philosophy. And that, that philosophy is something that permeates over generations. We're not going to solve this now. But um, this sort of thing gets people at least thinking about what it is that we do with healthcare. So um, I think that, I think that um, just, from, just from listening to the comments in the last few days, I, I understand that there has been some frustration with physicians over the years. I know that. <laughs> and, and I am a patient too, and I, I, I've had a variety of experiences with healthcare providers, just like I've had a variety of experiences with everybody. And before I get into my ideas and our approach to it, I want to clarify a couple of things um, based on um, one of the many kind of N of one examples that, that um, earned a lot of energy here in the crowd, but um, may not have been exactly accurate. Um, th th this is a study from three years ago in academic medicine. It's the one about medical schools incorporating genetics into their curricula. And so I just wanted to point out that, in fact, it's, it's, it's three quarters of medical schools, which by the first year of medical school uh, have incorporated uh, genetics based on the 75% of the 149 schools who re responded in this study. And here's table one um, from that paper, which breaks it down a little bit more. This was done at uh, Indiana University, where I went to medical school. Um, so it's either a standalone class half the time or integrated into the rest of the curriculum half the time. Um, more, more often than not, it's taught with multiple instructors. Um, this is genetics in every flavor. It includes molecular biology down to practical stuff and theoretical stuff and everything else. Um, it's mostly in the first year, and the um, number of hours is on the order of 20 to 40 hours. It's also an old paper. Three years is old these days. And um, there are a number of schools, including our colleagues at Johns Hopkins, who have designed a beautiful new curriculum um, called Genes to Society, and you you've actually ha may have seen this model um, in the last couple of days uh, that sort of provides the, the contextual framework for the class that they offer over the whole medical curriculum there. So, I think of computers, that was nicely timed, the light chain. <laughs> I, I, think of, I, think of, um, I think of the computer as a really interesting metaphor for the role of, of the physician in our world. I was uh, um, alive long enough to know about computers that came before the original Macintosh in 1984. Um, but if I mention like the ENIAC from the University of Pennsylvania, or the Commodore 64, or the TRS-80, to my students, it'll be like telling them about Stonehenge, and I'm not sure we'll connect. <laughs> so I have to tell them about the oldest computer, which is the Macintosh here, right? So, but what's the point? When, when, you bought, when you bought this computer, why did you buy it? You bought it because it, hold, it held a lot of stuff. It's true that you could pixel by pixel draw shrimp 
And I did that. I did all kinds of little... <laughs> you're laughing because you got the Mac world that had the shrimp picture, and it was really beautiful, and you couldn't believe computers could do that. But in addition to being able to do that kind of stuff, and since it had to do with computers, my parents thought it was really cool that I was doing that, even though I was probably just killing neurons. But the com the, so the computer held a lot of stuff, and it could even hold you know, a bunch of books. And you remember how the encyclopedia salesperson was replaced by the disk, and people would brag about how a disk could hold so much information, and that's why you bought it. And of course, that's not why you buy a computer now. In fact, um, I had back pain because of the laptop that I was carrying around, which was a few years old. And so I, I, I bought a, a lighter computer because I, I just wanted something that I could carry with me. But what do I want to make sure that computer has? It has to have a wide bore conduit to the world. That's what makes it valuable. Connectivity is everything right now. So I don't have any books on, on my computer, but it connects me to anything I need to know. So, so this physician with a leather bag and a horse and a buggy had to know a lot of stuff because he couldn't log in and he couldn't text because he was at somebody's house and that person was giving birth or that person was in pain. And so he was the expert. Denny Cortese was the CEO of Mayo Clinic up until this last year when, when uh, his term ended and, and uh, Dr. John Noseworthy took over. In 2004, uh, Dr. Cortese was quoted by Fast Company and the summary of this quotation is, at Mayo Clinic, we don't hire the doctors who know all the answers. We hope they do, but if they don't, it's okay. We hire the people who we know know who to call. And I think that's analogous to having the wide bore conduit to the world. There's a certain hubris that has characterized clinical medicine over the last century in this country, which gets in the way of just about everything. If you disagree, let me know. It's not obviously universal, and I know many, many, many physicians who are wonderful people, and, and if they cared for me, I would be really grateful. Nurses, too. Nurses are more innovative than doctors are, if you look at the literature. But that's also something else that has to change, I believe, in my opinion. I'm not speaking on behalf of the Mayo Clinic, but everybody I know there would agree with me that, <laughs> that, <clears throat> that to some degree we're experts, but we're only experts to the degree that we can be experts to help you. Otherwise, we're citizens of the world, we're part of a community, and we've got to work together to try to make sure that you are happy and well. That's the point. Was that a soapbox? Sorry. So, so, so along the lines of philosophy, there's something called minimally disruptive medicine, which my friend at Mayo Clinic, um, Victor Montori, talked about at this symposium, which I'll shamelessly plug, plug three times during this talk. Um, and so Victor, in, in September, gave this talk about minimally disruptive medicine, and here's what he said. He said, and think about the regulatory force, some synergy that I mentioned before. If I'm a person who's being cared for, and my diabetologist says that I need to take insulin, and that the insulin is going to require that I go to the store and that I buy some supplies, and that I have to do it a certain way, and that I have to measure uh, at certain times what my blood sugar is, and every three months or so I need to get a hemoglobin A1C, and I also need to have my diet be a certain way, and I need to follow an exercise regimen. I can handle that, and I have relatives who are diabetic, and they do the best they can to handle that. But what happens then when I have another problem with one of my parts? I go to somebody else who has another laundry list of things, and, and that person does an exemplary job of sharing with me that laundry list of things. But then someone else has something else for me to do. And so what Dr. Montori is finding with a colleague in the UK is that on average, a person in this country has about two hours of homework to do every day just to live and follow through with these expectations. And I love Sam, and Sam's learning how to do homework, and he's a lot better at it than I was. But sometimes he just wants to throw in the towel because it's beautiful outside. And so the idea behind minimally disruptive medicine is that at some point we as a healthcare community should think about what the aggregate effect is on an individual of all the tests and therapies and expectations rather than labeling it non-compliance, which is embarrassing. It's a new way of thinking and Daniel Pink wrote a really wonderful book called A Whole New Mind. Has anyone read that? 
If you haven't, I recommend it. It's a good read. He expands on the idea that there's left brain and right brain thinking. And he makes the point that this, these are not exclusive of one another. And he makes the point that it doesn't explain everything. He did lay down in a functional MRI so that he could see for himself that when he thinks in a certain way, in a linear way, more blood goes to parts of his left brain. And that when he thinks in a more emergent, expansive, synthetic way, more blood goes to the right side of his brain. And so he wrote a book about it. It's really interesting. And what Daniel Pink said was that the past is characterized as the age of the knowledge worker. Think about the physician, and for that matter, lots of other data-driven professionals in the 20th century when I read this. The knowledge worker, the well-educated manipulator of information and deployer of expertise. The thinking, it's characterized in the past by thinking that is narrowly reductive and deeply analytical. Well, actually, a, a really knowledgeable expert who's really analytical sort of, sort of characterizes the physician for the last hundred years. So Pink proposes two concepts for the future. He says that what will be, and he's not talking about doctors. I am, but it's applicable, I think. Pink proposes that high concept is characterized by the capacity to detect patterns and opportunities, to create artistic and emotional beauty, to craft a satisfying narrative, to combine seemingly unrelated ideas into something new. This is not fluffy. This is useful. <clears throat> and high touch, the ability to, emphasize, emph to empathize with others, to understand the subtleties of human interaction, to find joy in oneself and to elicit it in others, and to stretch beyond the quotidian in pursuit of purpose and meaning. Why? He asks that question. And he says it's for three reasons. It's because of material abundance, globalization, and technology. And with respect to material abundance, what, what Dan Pink said is that once we have everything that we want, our non-material yearnings are deepened. So I've got the TV, I've got the whatever it is, the Game Boy, I've had the tests, I've seen the specialist, I've got the drugs, I've got, 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 got. And so now our instinct now is to want to be listened to again. And that's not new, except we got, we got a little distracted by all the material stuff for a while. It doesn't explain everything, but I think it's applicable. So there's a balance, and I want to reiterate that. So what does a person need? If, if any of you studied um, anything about uh, organizational behavior or psychology, you've probably seen this triangle. Do you recognize this? Yeah, that's right. So another Abraham. So this is Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of need. And obviously, this is also a continuum. And uh, you can't say that one of these stages definitely has to precede the other. And it's all in motion and so forth. But if I'm, if I'm taking care of someone in the hospital, um, it's, I think it's worth, and this is, now we're getting into things that, that we share with our medical students in this preclinical block. Um, we do a pretty good job in the hospital of focusing on mostly physiology in the United States. And so if you, if you, if you I can help you if this is uh, too far away. With respect to breathing, food, water, sex, sleep, homeostasis, and excretion, we really help you with most of those when you're hospitalized. Um, and I have heard people say it depends on your health plan. But, and I'm, and I, and I'm, and I'm grateful for the editors who work with the video from me. So, um, so, so why does that matter? Well, I think it matters because up here under self-actualization is acceptance of facts. That's what we do every morning or twice a day or hopefully at least twice a day or three times a day or throughout the day. That's why I'm a hospital-based internal medicine doctor because we have to differentiate in medicine because there's too much to do. Bless you. So it's not possible to go to clinic and then multitask and run from clinic to the hospital and just touch base and make sure everybody's alive and go back to clinic. It's just not possible anymore. And so that's why, that's why my profession and others have emerged. So if, if during rounds in the hospital, I'm expecting somebody to accept facts, or at least to work with me to problem solve, Maslow would say, to some degree, I can't get there if the person doesn't have a sense of family if I have visiting hours, or if there's no place in the room for family to sit, or if the family is ignored by members of my team. 
Security of body is not trivial. If I, if, if, I, if I standardize putting somebody into a big napkin that ties into the back and, put them in a, and I put them in a cold room, that's not security of body. And, and, if it's not, and, and when that's the case, then what happens when others come into the room? Is it easy for that person to be respected equally by others or for that person to respect others? These are all interwoven. And so I want the students in the preclinical block to go into the hospital with this in mind before they go in thinking that it's all about blood pressure. Um, here's a, a low resolution photo of a hospital from years ago and it's improvable, those conditions. And then um, here's another one from Vienna. The patient transport system is also improvable. <laughs> and, um, and then here's one from Brooklyn uh, around the turn of uh, the century before this one. And, um, and this is from Indiana. I don't know if that little right knee looks familiar. Um, and this is the hospital where I work in Minnesota. And we try to incorporate some degree of humanity into everything that we do. Speaking of humanity, this gentleman, Arthur Kleinman, is an anthropologist at Harvard. That's what he looks like. And here's what he said. He studied traditional healers. That's the background. He's an ethnographer too, right? Some have been critical about how effective traditional forms of healing are for serious illnesses. Yet after reviewing the most recent ethnographies of traditional healers, I'm impressed that when these practitioners have been appropriately studied, they seem not to be constrained in the human quality of their care in the same way as are their biomedical colleagues. He uses biomedical to refer to people who work in the Western Hemisphere like doctors these days. Rather, the structures of traditional he healing center on human experience and its modes of interaction. And the, all of that is the preface to this. Less advantaged in technology, they are more advantaged, it seems, in humanity. Really? Does, why does that have to be true? Does that have to be true? I mean, we have everything else. I mean, we, 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 could, we can send ships up into space and take pictures of Saturn, and, and, and we can't just have humanity, right? Soapbox, Ken. But it's true. And Abraham Flexner said the same thing. Scientific medicine in America is characterized as young, vigorous, and positivistic, but today it's sadly deficient, today, 100 years ago, in cultural and philosophical background. So I, I, I take that into account when these really smart students, who are way smarter than I was when I went to medical school, are, um, are preparing to step into a clinical setting. It's six weeks, like I said, between the second and third years, and it's happening right now. I, I left it to come here, and I go back to it on Monday. So very quickly, I'm going to just flip through some slides, which, which have details of medical education that you'll find throughout the United States. Contextual learning in classrooms, in the clinic, in the hospital. Clinical tapas is my terminology, because I'm a foodie. But a little bit of medicine, a little bit of surgery, a little bit of pediatrics, some allergy, some OBGYN, some dermatology, and so forth. But the point is they're not rotating in the hospital. They don't have responsibilities. This is a gentle movement from one kind of culture to another. And so I have um, colleagues in all of these professions who come and spend integrated time with the students during these six weeks. They have a long course that's, that's, um, that, that sort of traverses these six weeks in evidence-based medicine, which is excellent. Um, they have, uh, during this this six-week block, the objective standardized clinical exam, which allows them to compare their clinical skills, not diagnostic skills, but clinical interactive skills with others and with a standard. We use Mayo's Simulation Center, which is excellent. Um, and we uh, have explicit instruction in professionalism and in, I'll go back so you can see, humanity. We also have an introduction to the care community uh, period where the um, medical students have a, basically a social time with nurses and pharmacists and physical therapists and um, the people who work in environmental services and the dietitians and the chaplains and, all, and the unit clerks and all the other people who work in the hospital who are part of their professional community from here until they stop working. And these are people whom they should not meet at the bedside. And then the rest of the preclinical block, to the degree that I can, I try to include uh, in it um, ways of thinking differently. And so I start with that man again. His sons, by the way, were William and Charlie Mayo, the Mayo brothers who started the Mayo Clinic. 
And Mayo Clinic was an innovative and entrepreneurial group practice <clears throat> that was preceded by a landscape of many individual practitioners. So Minnesota kind of looked like that, along with this and other states. There's just a lot of individuals. And so then this is the original Mayo Clinic building, a red brick building, which kind of now sat in this state, surrounded by a lot of individual practitioners. So it was an innovative approach to healthcare at the time. The other thing that was amazing, one of the many things that were amazing about these brothers is that although they didn't have jets and Twitter and email and so forth, they did manage to get to Europe to meet with Madame Curie and to South America to meet with surgeons in Uruguay, to go all over the place, and then to come back and to share every part of their experience. These were not vacations. And they wrote them up. And the original copies of the Mayo Clinic proceedings sit in our library for us to see. They were, they were citizens and scholars of the world. And they felt that it was the, our professional obligation to learn about our world so that we could do our job better. And they had a reading room where people were required to read stuff other than you know, the predece about the predecessors to the Golgi apparatus. So this is our <coughs> excuse me, institution now. And before our students start going into um, this institution, I share with them some more, with my colleagues, um, uh, some, some more lessons from other disciplines. So for example, here's some geometry. As you all know, as a cube grows, its volume grows a whole lot faster than its surface area. So you'd need 144 times more red paint in order to paint the big cube. But you'd need almost you know, more than 1,700 times more water if you were to fill a cube-sized container. This ratio is obviously the most true with spheres, but I think that the scale is easier to see with cubes. Makes the point. The reason I share this geometry with you is that as any organization, any organization grows, the average person in that organization, just by virtue of this ratio that I just shared with you, is more likely to be aware of what's going on inside than at the surface. So as an organization grows, healthcare, a company, those routines, those operations within that company become more and more the entire conscience of the person within the organization. So the effect is that companies which start as nimble, Apples and Googles grow into these companies which become, uh, uh, which have a much harder time staying innovative. And the shelf life of companies over the last couple of thousand years will, will uh, bear that out. It's not a foregone conclusion that the species called an organization will just keep living. And I think that's part, partly why. And so I mentioned routines. We all have routines working in offices and clinics and factories and operating rooms and rounds, but there are opportunities, opportunity costs to routines. And one of the beautiful videos that um, is available on YouTube, and I, I won't play it here for the sake of time, but here's a snapshot for those of you who have seen it or for those of you who um, want to, to know what it looks like at least. Anybody in this room know what this is? So, um, so that is Joshua Bell. He's, he's, he's arguably one of the greatest musicians alive. And um, this is the Metro in Washington, D.C. And in January of 2007, I want to say, um, the Washington Post set Joshua Bell up next to a trash can in a t-shirt with a baseball cap on to play his violin, his $2.3 million violin, during the morning. And this gentleman and this lady are among the like 1,100 people who walked by during their routines. He, Joshua made about 30 bucks. <laughs> and this lady is the only lady who stopped to talk to him because she recognized him from when he played in the Library of Congress. And I think that, I think that night he sold out the Kennedy Center for expensive tickets, possibly and probably to at least one of the people who walked by. That is a beautiful and moving and a little bit sad video that's available on YouTube. That little study won the Pulitzer Prize, I think. Here's a really brief evolutionary biology lesson. There was an island called Mauritius. A bird lived on it. People arrived, and the bird died. 
that's, that's the conclusion of the lesson. <laughs> and so it was the dodo bird, and the dodo bird got used to its routines. All it knew was its routine. And it loved living on the island of Mauritius, and it didn't know people were going to arrive, and it had no way of preparing for that, so it died. But that principle, I think, is scalable. It's true of the dodo bird. It's true of me. It's true of my organization. It's true of our country. And this is a fern, and this, this uh, collection of fronds is, is mathematically uh, like a fractal, right? It's the same as this. And this is made up of little ones that are the same. So at every level, the principle holds. That's Clayton Christensen. He is the uh, professor at Harvard who coined the phrase disruptive innovation. It applies to healthcare, and um, the book which Scott Danielson and others have mentioned to you called Innovator's Prescription is worth the read. Those principles are applicable to healthcare. There's a paper from the Harvard Business Review in 2004 called The Ambidextrous Organization. Um, this is applicable to anybody who wants in an organization to innovate. Anybody know this paper? Anybody? So um, these authors did a study of, of companies. Again, it's metaphorical. It's to translate, right? I'm not a, company, a business person, but I'm a, I'm a lover of the interfaces between disciplines. If that's a company, and I want that company to innovate, and I just say to the company, go innovate, then less than 25% of the time, it's able to come up with its innovative business model. If I go to the same company, and I say, OK, you have a, an innovation center, and it reports to the rest of the company, that works about less than 25% of the time. And if I go to the company and I pick some man or woman who seems like he or she would be a really good innovation champion. Um, our friend Larry Keeley at the Doblin Group in Chicago says that's the, when the company goes around and thumps melons and finally finds a ripe one. That works 0% of the time. <laughs> the ambidextrous organization, these authors argue, is the one where people who represent the normal workings of the organization get together in kind of a, a cloned environment where they have the safety to accept variation and risk and uncertainty and all of these terms which in traditional biomedical research we try to avoid, but terms which are welcomed and embraced in an innovation setting. That works greater than 95% of the time. That's relevant in an organization that wants to try to innovate beyond a standard that was set 100 years ago today in Kentucky. I like this picture shared with me by my friends at um, a company in Israel called Systematic Inventive Thinking. Because it makes the point that innovation doesn't just require money. Money is important. But there are actually ways to innovate that require that you have less rather than more. And I don't know that this person leaving his or her apartment in Rochester, Minnesota after watching Desperate Housewives would have thought to do this, but constraints foster creativity. My favorite tool from the school of thought called systematic inventive thinking, which is derived from engineering and a principle called TRIZ, T-R-I-Z, is subtraction. And, and, and subtraction is where you, you take something and you, you make a list of its parts. And we're really good at parts, right? And then we identify the part that's probably the most critical part, and we take it away. And then we ask what we have. So if you take a TV, you make a list, and you remove the cathode ray tube, which is something that they used to use in the 20th century, <laughs> that had a screen in front of it, then what do you have? You don't have a radio. You have a screenless television. Well, why would you want a screenless television? Well, ask the companies that made all the products that are commercialized after going through that exercise. Not the least of which is one that helps
people who are hearing impaired sitting in the back of the room watch the game with their family. If I take a chair and I remove the legs, I have a baby chair that hooks onto the table. Or I have a beach chair. Or God forbid, I have a gaming chair. But they're, they're sold. Or if I take a shoe and I remove the sole and I replace it just with something that's transparent and a couple of lines, then I don't have to push down on a, on a reluctant little child's toes to see whether or not the shoe fits. I can just look at the line. Or if I take a clinic and I remove the doctor, and I have minute clinic. And that's a really successful model for providing health care in the United States that's been reproduced by a number of organizations. And following Clayton Christian's principles, minute clinic is a disruptive innovation because nurse practitioners and physician assistants are less expensive than interventional radiologists or, uh, or specialized internists. They're also a simpler intervention for simpler conditions. They know how to triage really well, that's prerequisite, but for strep throat and for paper cuts, it's fine to drive next to the local Walmart and to get checked out and to give them $15 or $20 and to go home instead of having to wait in an emergency department. And they're more accessible. Like I said, here you can see they're open seven days a week and most insurance is accepted and no appointments are necessary. It's like arriving in nirvana. And finally, it competes with non-consumption, which is one of the principles of a disruptive innovation. It, well, there was nothing like it there before. And so people gobble it up, like they did with MP3s. And so the consequence of a lot of these disruptive innovations is that care moves to other places. It moves away from the centralized, centralized, so harder to access, complicated, not good enough, but complicated, and expensive hospital. I'm, I hope my job becomes obsolete. I think that what's going to happen in the meantime is that my hospital is going to get smaller over the next 50 years over the next hundred years, that hospitals throughout the United States will be less necessary because so many things like hemodialysis that have moved from the hospital to dialysis centers and then to people's houses will continue to, to, uh, to emerge. And roles are emerging. And we've already heard about some of these global networks, global networks that, that are reshaping what biomedical research means. So Cure Together, Patients Like Me, LAMSITE, LIBA, the Neuromyelitis Optica Research Group, Duchenne's Muscular Dystrophy, Cancer Research Alliance, Community Health Data Initiative, and lots of others. I'll tell you about any of these, and there are lots, lots more. One of them, Cure Together, was founded by this molecular geneticist, um, Alexandra Carmichael. Alexandra Carmichael and her husband were um, members of the quantified self community. Anybody heard of that? They, they measure details of their lives for fun. They measure when they have headaches. They measure their pulse. If, if you can measure it, they measure it. And they meet in fun places once or twice a year. And they just explore ideas about how they measure these things and what we might be able to do with them. And they've been kind of overlooked. And you know people don't pay any attention to them and so forth. But you know what happened? Um, Alexandra formed this organization called Cure Together, where people who measure their own stuff can share it in a community, not unlike all the communities that you've probably heard of, but th that are evolving and uh, multiplying. And what she found once she had 1,000 or 1,500 people was that these people actually reported data that when analyzed in a, in a proper way from a statistical standpoint, reconfirmed findings from randomized controlled trials and published on paper after peer review. And not all of those details are earth-shattering details, but they're going to be. And, and what happens to the study after it's published? It's dead. It's published. It's in the library. What happens to Cure Together? It grows. So what happens when she goes from 1,000 people to 10,000 people to 2 million people? And suddenly we discover that pumpkin seeds cure, cure prostate cancer. 
And the people who wanted to write the study about pumpkin seeds never got in the door of the NIH, because why would you do that? But the power of large numbers, I think, are going to teach us things. And each of these global networks will generate data and are beginning to generate data that the medical students who are learning in the preclinical block in my school and in other schools throughout the United States need to be aware of. And I can't depend on the Facebook community for them to learn about it. It's my responsibility for them to be aware of these things. And we've already talked about the fact that lots of companies that weren't historically in healthcare, <clears throat> like um, uh, Walgreens Above and Beyond Pharmacy, or Qualcomm, or GE, you see quite a number of others here too, Google, Microsoft, they're becoming among the most innovative companies in healthcare. And so, and so going back to the lesson that was set for me by the, the Mayo brothers when they were in Minnesota and traveling around, it's important for all of us, not just me, not just Mayo Clinic, but for all of us to pay attention what the other, to what the other people are doing because the most exciting stuff happens at the boundaries. And as soon as we get caught in our routines, then we, we become virtually ineffective as innovators. And that's why this conference is so important. So Flexner saw three stages in medical education. One, which was dogma, around the time that people had single names in Greece. People were like, Liberace? Um, and, then, and, that's, and that's when philosophy was not to be questioned or bothered by the facts. And then another phase, which was characterized by empirical knowledge, that data was, was, was acknowledged as relevant to medicine. And then another phase, characterized by medicine being part of modern science. That's the part that Flexner championed. And so, Larry, is there a crucial fourth dimension of medical education? I mean, there has to be. And so that's what together I think we'll figure out. Please come to Rochester, Minnesota on September 12th, 2010, when it's beautiful, and meet some really amazing people. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for a really fun and thought-provoking talk. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. I was very interested when you were talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. Have you, or how have you applied that to patient care or also to possibly non-compliance and also interesting the way you flip that into expectations for patients? Um, so, uh, the, so the, I, did everyone hear the question? How, 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 is, how do we incorporate Maslow's hierarchy of needs into the way we care for people? Um, and so, it's by an acknowledgement that human beings are that system that includes all of those levels, and that it's not possible to just target in on one part and expect magic to happen. So there, there has to be trust between the people who are communicating. It, you know, ultimately, a colleague of mine named Maggie Breslin, who's the first designer researcher at our Center for Innovation, which is like an ambidextrous part of Mayo Clinic, um, she gave a talk at this conference last year. Her name is Maggie Breslin and the talk is online. I highly recommend it. It's a few minutes long. She gave the last talk of the symposium. And what Maggie said was that after observing thousands of interactions in healthcare, ultimately, good healthcare comes down to a good conversation. That without a good conversation, the other stuff doesn't really matter. There's too much room for problems. And that a good conversation is not the cherry on top of the sundae. It's the sundae. You have to have that first. And I think the only way to have that is to respect all levels of that hierarchy instead, instead of the 20th century model of, of, of diagnosing and treating the amalgam of organs that, comp that, that, that comprise a human organism. Breslin? Um, Maggie Breslin, B-R-E-S-L-I-N. Um. Yes, uh, uh, excellent talk. I, I really appreciate your creativity. Uh, I, I was curious, um, 
it, you, you, what you're doing at the Mayo Clinic looks really good. Uh, and I assume this is, as you mentioned, there's some of this going on around the country. How is this being exported to all medical schools? This is something that I would think should be a mandatory part of every medical uh, program. Well, that's really nice. I think that bits and pieces of it um, are, are present throughout the United States at the, these 149 medical schools. And um, it, it, this is the second year that, that uh, we've had it like this at Mayo Clinic. And so um, to the degree that we are able to continue learning and to refine it and to make it something that's shareable, you know, we live in an open source world and we want 149 medical schools in the United States to produce good physicians. Um, the, the, historically, the mechanism for that is to publish a paper. Um, and in 2010, although, although that part is useful, I suppose, for academic promotion and, and things like that, I think um, getting the word out happens through things like the um, AHRQ Innovation Exchange online, where, where tonight, before I go to sleep, I can put up sort of a diagram of what this is like, and other people can see it, and they can communicate with me. And before Monday shows up, they can have something drafted. I just don't know that it's that, that it, things are ironed out well enough to, to share, but that time is soon. I was curious, have you uh, collaborated at all with us? Uh, I know Andrew Weil has done a, uh -huh. he's doing an integrative medicine program in, in Arizona. Uh -huh. There's also Dean Ornish, there's a right. number of Deepak Chopra. Right. They're, they're doing a lot of uh, good good things. Are, are these being, are, are, are you guys collaborating with these? Are there some, you know, are there some models there that could work that could tie in? Right. So. Um, so you mentioned Andrew Weil, Deepak Chopra, and, and um, uh, Dean Ornish. And um, so I've spoken with all of them and um, uh, about their philosophies and about um, what it is that they bring to healthcare and um, try to correlate uh, a lot of what we do in the preclinical block with their message. Um, so yes, and, um, and, and yes, one, two, or three of them may be in, in Minnesota in September to continue this discussion. I'm, I'm done with the plugs, but I, it, he, he walked right into it. It's like a plant. Um, but but um, what I would say is, and I think this is important, it's the, it's the humility and, the, and the, the, not just the willingness and the tolerance, but the hunger to be a really thoughtful listener that allows for whatever insight those gentlemen and others have uh, uh, to become incorporated into the medicine that we practice. And, and, and we, are, we are obligated as, as, as healers and healthcare providers to be open to those things. I, um, I, okay. You want to ask a question? You want to? Sorry. Um, I'm happy yeah, to talk okay, to you. Yeah, yeah, uh, just a quick question. You know, we've heard a lot about technology at this conference. I've been a a long time student of technology and user and developer of technology and always worries me that we become a little bit too enamored with it. Uh, I also spent a lot of time talking with, we'll call them old timers, uh, old time very good academic clinicians and just recently I was in Boston in the garden of a very eminent uh, pathologist talking about medical education today. And one of the concerns he expressed, and I hear this time and time again, is that number one, we're too enamored with technology. We don't know how to think anymore, we don't know how to listen anymore, and we simply don't understand. And that this is a function of the medical education that's happening. And I'm just wondering how you might comment on that in relation to Mayo. You know, Mayo's a wonderful place, I've been there, although I must admit last time I was there, which was a long time ago, I was sworn by all sorts of young little people with Apple Newtons, which was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, perhaps you can talk about that, because one of the things that that does concern me. If you look at Germany, Germany is a very interesting model. And I've looked at Germany in a number of different industries. You learn to work with material before you learn to work with machines and computers. So you have a feel for the material so that when you use the machine, you really have something to gauge that machine and its value. And I think that when we start too much with technology, we, we, we lose sight of what we're trying to do. And so I'm just wondering how you tackle that at Mayo. Uh, so in a variety of ways, um, uh, one is that um, we acknowledge it as a facilitator of innovation, um, but it's not really the content. Uh, so uh, you know, in the medical record discussion, taking a paper medical record and scanning it and putting it into a computer is not an electronic medical record. And um, basically nothing that I'm trying to impart with my colleagues depends on technology. Technology is the bonus down the line. Mayo has a really substantial international health program. 
And um, most of the trainees who come back from that program say above and beyond all of the good personal benefit that they had, that they have a new appreciation for caring for people without ha uh, having the luxury of ordering stuff. I, I mean, technology is a bonus, but we have a lot to do before technology has to be part of the picture. From my standpoint, right? We're having 20 discussions here, but from the standpoint of training physicians, I, I really don't, I don't need to preoccupy them right now with technology other than the stuff that's going to help them take care of people in better ways. Um, I, I think uh, there are two main issues that I see in, in this discussion. And one is the disintegration of a uh, sense of community, which I think is a complicated discussion. But from the technological side, do you think that the uh, perfection of the smartphone uh, as a uh, interactive device for measuring and, and uh, uh, creating communities could be the major step forward in uh, medicine? I do think that, th that it's part of it and it's a real part of it. And the reason it's a real part of it is it's already part of our lives. So, you know, I may not have bought into it as much when we still had those really giant phones, you know, that were dangerous. Um, because the, the argument at the time would have been so visionary um, that most people in my position would have said, well, we don't, it's not ubiquitous, so how do we know, you know, what's the case for everybody using it? But this is a part of life now, so it's almost not an additional technology. It's just using the new appendage that has evolved. So, so maybe a certain amount of money and emphasis should be put on uh, to making the smartphone ubiquitous, especially for people with medical problems, to kind of create a, a database and a way of communicating. And maybe uh, the healthcare system should be uh, encouraging and financing developments in that area. Well, I would be reluctant to jump with both feet into that endorsement, and I'll tell you why. It goes back to my answer to the prior question. We have a lot of other stuff to do that's more important. So I, I do have colleagues at the Media Lab at MIT, including John Moore. John Moore is working on um, an interoperable, ubiquitous, uh, asynchronous system, including smartphones, for people to communicate with their healthcare providers. That's a good idea. It's being funded. I'm glad that it is. So I, I, there are a lot of models that are out there, and, and um, many of which don't require lots of extra money to capitalize on the technology that's already on people's belts. So yes, I think it's a good thing. I just I, I have to use the platform for a moment to say that m the average person in the United States does not believe there's a crisis because their iPhone isn't useful from a healthcare standpoint, as much as the kind of anxiety and frustration and pain that people feel, as we've heard in the last couple of days, about communication that doesn't involve any kind of chips between two people. Thank you. Okay, David, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.